Greetings to you all and uh, welcome. My name is Michael Spath. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, a member of the, member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, ICAD USA, and the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network. This is the last of four webinars designed for congregational use, exploring the implications of the 2021 United Church of Christ General Synod Resolution passed overwhelmingly with 85% of the vote, Declaration for a Just Peace Between Palestine and Israel. The first two dealt with the language of the UCC resolution, calling Israel's oppression of Palestinians sin and apartheid. The third examined Christian Zionism in the mainline church and American civil religion. The subject of this webinar is a human rights framework for a political solution. In a grand and tragic example of the irony of history, the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the creation of the State of Israel both occurred in 1948. We're fortunate today to have an all-star lineup as panelists. Sahar Francis, human rights lawyer and since 2006, general director of the Ramullah-based Adamir Prison Support and Human Rights Association. Jonathan Kutab, human rights lawyer, executive director of FASNA, Friends of Sabil North America, one of the co-founders of Al Haq Human Rights Organization and the Mandela Institute for Prisoners. And Lauren McRail, bridge pastor at University Christian United Church of Christ, Seattle, Washington, mission co-worker in Israel, Palestine, for Global Ministries of the, Christian, of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, and the United Church of Christ from 2013 to 2018. Welcome uh, to you all. So let's get right to it. Uh, just yesterday, Amnesty International joined Human Rights Watch, uh, Yesh Din, uh, an Israeli organization, and B'Tselem, another human rights organization, uh, uh, Israeli. Uh, as well as the Palestine Christian Cry for Hope, as well as the United Church of Christ Declaration in uh, uh, accusing Israel of committing the crime against humanity of apartheid. It named what Israel is doing to Palestinians apartheid. Huh? So say a word about the importance of this report and uh, uh, why it's uh, uh, so important uh, that we name what Israel is doing apartheid using international law as the standard. Uh, Lauren, do you want to start for us, please? Sure. It's important, as all the reports are, including um, in particular, I think, Beth Selim's report, um, that coming from an Israeli organization, um, as well as Human Rights Watch, because there is... Um, I would say an international acceptance by human rights organizations to call it as it is, which is apartheid, which um, people have known for decades that um, the situation there uh, of unequal rights, um, discrimination against Palestinians, both inside 48 and within the occupied territories, including occupied East Jerusalem, is indeed apartheid in every sense of the word. And, and so um, I don't think this is a tipping point or a shift, but more of an affirmation, uh, even a confirmation that this is what it is and this is how we must proceed. When I lived there, uh, the Palestinians felt that there were two, two ways to approach this uh, situation, which was to stop calling it a conflict, to use boycott, divestment, sanctions, and international law. Apartheid, if it gets to the ICC, um, will have implications for nation states who belong, and they must adhere to international law and stop trade, stop uh, hosting cultural events. And so people look to South Africa for this. So it's good news um, and, and long expected that Amnesty International would um, speak up at this time. 
Thank you, Lauren. Sahar, please. Yes, I think as a lawyer working on the ground for human rights for more than 25 years, we were always the Palestinian local uh, human rights organizations alerting about the existence of the apartheid system, especially when it comes for the judicial system. Being a lawyer for so long, representing Palestinian prisoners in the military court system and comparing the two different legal systems that were implemented in uh, the region, one system for the Israeli uh, settlers who lived in the occupied territories and one uh, military system to control and oppress the Palestinian people. It was so clear that this is an apartheid. And of course, the report of amnesty today is very important in confirming and uh, 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 like supporting all the arguments that we were trying to bring to the international level and unfortunately were not accepted, especially by uh, politicians in the international level. So I hope today the, the international community, especially the International Criminal Court, the UN uh, General Assembly and different the third state parties would take it more seriously and think about the uh, uh, conclusion that Amnesty included in their report. And uh, uh, as Lauren said, take their responsibilities according to the international law and stop being complicit with this regime because it's a war crime and crime against humanity according to the international law. Thank you, Sahar. Jonathan? Uh, yes, I think that we are approaching a very significant uh, turning point, uh, not from the uh, point of view of what is going to change anytime soon, but in terms of how Israel and its supporters view uh, the situation. Uh, I cannot escape the feeling that they think they won. They think they have all the power to do what they want, and they think that they no longer need to abide by international law, no longer need to abide by international public opinion, uh, no longer need to worry about uh, the Arab countries, the Arab world, uh, the churches, international community. Uh, but as they became, become less dependent on the international uh, community, uh, they find that international law itself becomes their enemy human rights organizations themselves become the enemy. And so they work deliberately, uh, comprehensively to undermine international law, to undermine international organization, uh, and to use their own definition for what is legitimate, what is right, and what is wrong. The IHRA definition of anti-Semitism that they are using now, uh, legislating against BDS, uh, threatening judges, courts, uh, if they were to go against them, uh, yeah. really wielding power. That is a new uh, uh, position that they are taking, uh, which I think uh, makes the whole struggle really a global one. Jonathan, I want to follow up uh, with you and the other panelists uh, on that very point. When we talk about international law, governments and courts have been given the responsibility to enforce it, to enforce uh, international law, but have refused to do so for political and other reasons. The international community, Amnesty International Report says, <clears throat> quote, has stood by as Israel has been given free reign to dispossess, segregate, control, oppress, and dominate Palestinians. Say a word about that and what can be done to give these reports, these designations by all these organizations, these human rights organizations, some teeth. Yes, uh, I think international law, just like regular law, operates largely by consent and by legitimacy. People drive on the right hand side of the road, for example, in those countries that they do, uh, <laughs> not because there's a policeman at every corner. 
but because they comply by international law, there are exceptions, there are those who violate it, that's when the police and the courts step in. Uh, th that is the case also with international law. It, it gains when people support it. And when governments do not support it, civil society, the churches, the unions, the masses uh, have to step in. And this is why BDS, for example, is so vital because it confirms that there are rules, there are laws, there are standards which apply to one and all equally. And if the governments don't do it, then we have to step in and say, you must comply by international law. Thank you, Jonathan. I do have a question later on about BDS, so we'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, thank you for bringing that up though, very important. Uh -huh. Sahar? I think it's very important to highlight the fact that unfortunately the Israeli high court and uh, uh, the other courts in Israel were systematically ignoring the international law, uh, uh, especially the international humanitarian law and the international human rights law as an applicable tool uh, and the framework for the occupied Palestinian territories. And they were kind of legitimizing all the practices of the Israeli government in violating the uh, 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 international law under the uh, 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 assumption of the security need and based on uh, secret information. And this is why it's very important today to use this legal analysis that was brought in the amnesty report that you mentioned in the first uh, uh, question in order to show how problematic is the legal system inside the state of Israel, not just in the context of the occupied territories, but as well for the Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel, including in East Jerusalem, and without like dismantling this apartheid system, there's no way how you can seek justice within the framework of the legal system, whether it's an internal legal system or international or implementing the international standards of international law. Thank you, Lauren. I, I wanna approach this from a slightly different angle. Um, I became aware as I lived there um, that the diplomats who I got to know in Jerusalem, including the humanitarian coordinator at the time, uh, they felt very bound by uh, either the UN and or uh, the Oslo Accords. So the diplomats uh, who um, many of them uh, knew that there was no two state solution, um, they felt or were told or required to continue to promote the two state solution. And, and so looking at human rights, international law was at best secondary. Um, the coordinator of the uh, at the time, the, um, I remember telling him or, or speaking with him after church at uh, Redeemer after doing a um, sermon on Gaza and the killing of children. And I said, um, and he wept through the sermon. And I said, what are you able to do? And I said, is your code red uh, be only able to say we have grave concerns? And through his sort of tears. He said, yes, that's as far as we can go. I said, I don't know what to say, because <laughs> it is much more than a grave concern. And it's much more than a, a Christian outrage. It, it is against every, it's a crime against humanity, not just children. It seems like you need other language to enforce here. And he said, we do, but this is what I'm trapped by. And as far as the United States goes, as we know, the U.S. has blocked every important um, uh, resolution brought to the Security Council. I think only once under Obama, like a few days before he left office, uh, did his administration actually not veto um, settlement building. So the United States is a major force in us staying um, in the fixed place that we are. And lastly, um, 
if Israel continues to say they have the right to self-defense and the United States defends their right to self-defense at all costs, you are caught in a bind. And, and that's why it's also still important to talk to you about occupation, because under the laws of occupation, the occupier Israel does not have the right to self-defense. In fact, the Palestinians have the right to self-defense, and that includes the use of force. Absolutely. And so, so until we kind of untangle these things and regain the proper language to describe, it's not just apartheid, uh, we will be stuck. Um, Thank you, Lauren. Um, Sahar, um, I want to shift gears just a bit. Just four months ago, the Israeli Defense Ministry issued a military order declaring your organization, Adamir, along with five other Palestinian civil society and human rights organizations as terrorist organizations. Talk to us about that order, its impact upon your work, and how you're doing and how Adamir uh, is doing in its wake. Actually, um, allow me to clarify that uh, the Israeli security minister used the Israeli civil system, the anti-terror law of 2016, to designate us as terrorist organizations. And three weeks after, the military governor issued his military order declaring us as uh, illegal entities which means we are subjected for both different legal systems. And this is, brings me to the implementation actually of the Israeli annexation plan silently in the, on the ground uh, uh, without respecting like they're, they're trying to convince the world that they stopped the annexation plan. But our uh, case as uh, sex organizations is totally fitting in this political context. Why now? Why they designated human rights organizations as terrorist organizations while some of us works in area C in favor of supporting farmers and women and children and prisoners and defending human rights and, and facing all these war crimes and crimes against humanity. This is done in order to silence us, in order uh, 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 to keep, like, to take us out of the work that we were trying to push, especially on the level of accountability. And I totally agree with Lauren that the apartheid is not the only legal context that we should take in consideration when we're trying to seek justice and accountability. Of course, there's all the uh, uh, related laws of the colonialism and the uh, uh, occupation. And uh, uh, the important thing here uh, that the, how easy actually the Israelis manipulating the law, whether it's the civil law or the military orders in order to convict any Palestinian and to uh, 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 declare him as a terrorist, this is, would be the easiest way in order to make this person illegal or this entity illegal. And in our case, the main uh, motivation behind this was to dry our fund resources and to uh, shut us down in order to silence us and affect our work, as I said, especially on the international level. Thank you. Jonathan Al-Haq, uh, an organization uh, of which you were one of the co-founders, uh, was also on that list. Yes, uh, I think if, if this goes to what I started saying earlier, that, 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 that Israel and its supporters feel that they have all the power now, uh, that they no longer have to abide by rules, uh, but they still feel vulnerable to the legal and the ethical and the moral approach, which is why they are trying to silence those who use legal language and who document human rights violations, <clears throat> and who uh, look at the facts on the ground and who threaten to bring them before the international criminal courts. But I'd like to use that to follow up on what Lauren was saying earlier. Somehow, the battle now has shifted. 
and it has shifted to the uh, grounds of morality and human rights and ethics and justice. And one of the things that the prophets used to do in the old days was to shift people away from legalism, shift people away from categories which the establishment knows how to manipulate and say, look, I don't care. I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want your prayers. I don't want your legalism. I want to see justice being done because what you are doing is wrong. And maybe this is where the churches especially uh, come in uh, very strongly and say, look, what is happening is wrong and we must shift away from it. You can't keep referring back to Oslo. Doesn't work anymore. That framework is no longer valid. The real framework is justice. What is it doing to people on the ground? And this is where I think the battle has become a spiritual battle. That, that's a wonderful segue, Jonathan, to what I want to ask Lauren for you to uh, address. I think one of the more powerful parts of the United Church of Christ resolution is the first resolved, which says, and, and the rejection, where it says, quote, we reject the notion that Israel's occupation of Palestine is a purely political problem outside the concern of the church, that, quote, the continued oppression of the Palestinian people remains, after more than five decades of oppression, a matter of theological urgency and represents a sin in violation of the message of the biblical prophets and the gospel. So, Lauren, you're a member of the UCC Palestine Israel Network Steering Committee, and you were intimately involved uh, with John Thomas and Ali and the Steering Committee with the creation of the resolution. Say a word about why a human rights-based approach is consistent with a gospel-based approach. Okay, I'll try to be succinct. Let me start on a, a spiritual space. And, um, and it's, it's a quote uh, from a book on faith and human rights. And um, it says this, human beings participate in God's image because God participates in humanity as a victim of human rights abuse. Um, in my reading, this, this particular paragraph really caught my attention because the incarnation itself, which is fundamental to many and all uh, denominations and perspectives, is that God is in the mix with us as human beings and therefore not only are we all created in God's image, God is in with each of us. And so uh, fundamentally, then everyone um, is uh, a person, a human being that deserves dignity. And dignity is at the core of human rights and, and human rights are at the core then of international law. And so people of faith um, can find a very clear line between what we say we are about um, theologically and how it is practiced in the political sphere. When um, in 2019, uh, the UCC Penn Steering Committee uh, before a general uh, synod decided that it was important that we as a Penn group, separate but related obviously to the UCC, uh, declare that we were going to follow a human rights-based framework. Um, and that was because we were um, two reasons. One was Kairos Palestine and the cry for hope. Um, and other documents coming from our Christian partners were saying um, that this is apartheid. Uh, we want you to, um, to intervene and speak up for us. So we felt obliged uh, in the, the deep spiritual sense to respond, but also we realized that it was important for us uh, as a denomination to stop supporting um, uh, statements, articulations of a two-state solution, that that was not the way for us to go 
uh, not only because that was what the United States was doing, and we saw no positive results from that, but that by moving towards a human rights framework, we were more able to stand in the space of supporting uh, the rights of Palestinians, whether they were in 48 or in the occupied territories, for the right of sovereignty, their choice of what kind of government they were going to have, two state, one state, federated state. We wanted to remove ourselves from being in the position of supporting only one solution. Um, Thank, so you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Sahar, uh, uh, I want you to address this from maybe a different angle. Many U.S. Uh, rights organizations have come out to support Adamir and the other civil society human rights organizations. Tell us why it's important uh, for American churches like the United Church of Christ to support your work. I think um, I think it's exactly fitting in Lauren's answer because it's supposed to be a rights-based approach, rights and dignity for uh, uh, everyone, especially for the Palestinians as the oppressed uh, people. Damir is focusing on the work of prisoners. This is one of the most vulnerable groups under the occupation and also inside Israel in the uh, uh, events that took place in last April, May inside uh, uh, Israel, like all the attacks against the demonstrators in the Palestinian community, the harassment, the, arra the arrest, it just shows how this system is using the imprisonment. And since we are trying to reach justice in the international level, and because of the hypocrisy of the political leaders in the different states, especially in the United States, where there is unlimited support for the Israeli position and the Israeli interest in the international level, especially in the UN. And when it comes, when we are trying to seek justice via the Human Rights Council or the ICC or the ICJ or the Security Council, and we are always facing the veto of the state of uh, uh, America, this is, brings the responsibility on the American citizens to support the Palestinians as grassroots in their activism versus their political position of their country. Thank you, Sahar. Uh, when we discuss a human rights-based framework, we make reference as you all have been doing so far to international law. What are, uh, so whether it's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the International Court of Justice or the Fourth Geneva Convention. Uh, I, I want you to be very specific here. Uh, could you name two or three of those tenets of international law that we should be referencing in our churches and in our conversations that apply to Palestine, Israel? So a couple of those tenets of international law that we uh, should know about and be referencing. Um, Jonathan, first please. That's a difficult one because Israel has been consistently and systematically violating <laughs> many of these principles. Uh, one thinks of collective punishment, for example, when you punish a whole group for what one or more individuals in that group do. Uh, you can think of due process of law, when administrative punishments, whether it's detention or house demolitions or uh, other uh, methods are used. Yeah, you can think of uh, international law pertaining to occupation. If you, if you want to live within the, the paradigm of states and sovereign states and military occupation, there's very detailed uh, conventions, uh, both the Hague and the uh, Geneva Conventions, on what you're allowed or not allowed to do uh, when you uh, happen to be in charge of another people through military occupation, through belligerent occupation. You can't move your population in, you can't have settlements, etc. Uh, you can talk about specific individual rights, torture, uh, for example, uh, treatment of the bodies of those who, uh, who, who are 
killed that you withhold their bodies uh, from their families and don't allow a decent burial. But the principle behind all of them is that international law provides for human rights and human dignity on the basis of equality for everyone. There are no exemptions. There is no exceptionalism. Uh, not the United States, not Israel, and not any country can say, we're different. We're good people. These rules don't apply to us. We have our own internal structures. No, there are universal values that apply to one and all. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Sahar, what would you like to add? I would add uh, uh, um, the issue of the decision actually of the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, on the uh, wall case when they reconfirmed that both systems, the international humanitarian law, like the Fourth Geneva Convention and the uh, Hague regulations, and also all the human rights treaties are applicable uh, on the occupied territories and Israel should respect, which means even the convention again uh, for the rights of the children, the uh, 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 convention against racism, uh, discrimination against the women, and all these specific treaties on the labor, on the economical rights, cultural rights and all civil rights are protected under the Convention for Political and Civil Rights and Israel are obliged to implement them. So it's relating to house demolitions, to labor's rights, to all kinds of different individual rights that Israel should uh, respect in the occupied territories as well. Beside, of course, what uh, Jonathan said. Thank you. Lauren, you wanna add anything? Um, just a little bit, but I think Sahar said it very well, um, in particular around the rights of children, which is one of our resolutions um, a few years back, in part because we felt it was so clear for anyone in our uh, denomination, even if they did not know um, a lot about uh, Israel-Palestine, they would understand that the imprisonment of children even for simply picking up a stone, the administrative detention for up to a year that, that this was not right. Um, and that it was um, also possible for us to draw the connection between the incarceration of black and brown people in the United States um, and to what was happening here, to what was happening there. So I think this is one of the places. I wanna lift up two other places. Uh, one is um, um, the ongoing uh, um, statement that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Um, and that because the United States, including the Democratic Party, affirm that, um, I don't know if you're aware, but every year when, um, uh, the presidential elections come to the place of the platform to put forward a candidate. I remember this with Obama. There's a statement read about what the democratic platform is, and it always asserts that um, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And, and this is um, clearly um, uh, against uh, the, well, in this case, it's against the Oslo Accords. Uh, Jerusalem is to remain a shared city uh, by the faiths, and, and so it does not belong to either of them. So one of the things that the Biden administration did not do um, is to immediately uh, take the embassy out and return the consulate. Um, and though these look like perhaps window dressing to people, um, it is important, I think, uh, for us as a church uh, to stand um, against um, this, the statement that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And the other part, and, and as um, a former World Council of Churches EAPPI volunteer at the Bethlehem Wall, um, the, the wall itself and all that is connected to it um, is not just a barrier, although there are places where it actually does follow the green line, where it doesn't um, became a, an important foothold to all the denominations in the United States um, 
for us to take a stand and to um, actually boycott and divest in particular from those companies that were using uh, electronic equipment, Motorola Solutions comes to mind. Um, and, and so that is a, a way in which we connect our uh, understanding of human rights to action. Um, and we've had a few successes um, in that area. And the last is annexation of land and property. Um, if most of you have followed the ongoing horrible saga of Sheikh Jarrah, and in particular, Mohammed al Kurd. And um, he has some very interesting things to say about the use of international law as it applies to his family and the families in Sheikh Jarrah. And one of them is simply, and it go back to what Jonathan said about equality and equity. It is not enough just to say it's a crime against humanity. It is the theft of a life. It's the theft of people who have lived in their community, in their homes for years. Um, and, and I think churches have the uh, moral, spiritual obligation to translate these um, statements of um, like a crime against humanity into a language and into stories that people um, in this case uh, on the ground can understand. Um, thank, you. Yeah, thank you. For decades, uh, the approach to the Israeli-Palestinian peace process was to consider a dispute over land are focused on sovereignty or borders or security arrangements or nationalistic aspirations. As I thought about the advantages of a human rights-based framework, uh, I, I thought of a few. It holds accountable violators of human rights. It, it gives Palestinians a, a platform for international support around their rights. It uh, evens out the imbalance of power between the parties. It makes the U.S. a more credible partner in the peace process. It's an important first step in the long and difficult road to reconciliation. What are your thoughts about the advantages? Uh, we talked about the lifting up of human dignity and human rights-based approach is a gospel-based approach. Uh, what are some of your thoughts about the advantages of such a framework? Sahar? I'm a bit biased as a lawyer uh, in favor of the rights-based approach and all the, because for me, justice cannot happen without really uh, equality and implementing all these standards of human rights in an equal way for everyone. And this is why uh, uh, for us, the Oslo agreement and all this political a discussion around the process, it was unfair and unjust. And, and it was clear that it will not lead for a real solution because it was not based on equality and justice for all. And it was a, a, a one-sided and uh, enabling actually the Israelis to continue with their control over the Palestinian people and the Palestinian land. And this is why we're trying to push more and more the uh, standards of uh, 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 the rights-based approach. But again, I think it's not enough to implement the rights or to recognize the rights. They are supposed to be as well accountability. Because I think without paying the price for all these crimes that were committed for decades, since 48, not just since 67, there's no gonna be a lasting peace in this region. They should recognize what they did, they should be accountable for it, and they should stop violating more and more and being like open to recognize the uh, basic rights of, especially the self-determination of the Palestinian people. Thank you, Sahar. Jonathan? Well, I'm gonna say something that may upset some people on this, uh, on this call. 
Uh, I think that a large part of the problem is that the peace and justice community has fallen into the trap of thinking that we have more power than we do, or thinking that we have a responsibility to solve the problem. We don't. We have a responsibility to call out for justice, to call out against injustice, to stand with the oppressed. We do not have the power to change the situation on the ground in any major way. We do have the power to uh, speak truth to those who are in power. We have the moral and ethical responsibility and capability of, of taking a prophetic uh, stand. We don't have the job of solving the problem. We are not Henry Kissinger. We are not called upon to come up with the right balance between the different uh, uh, conflicting uh, interests. Uh, we, we cannot succeed if we're playing power politics because those who are in power will always be able to dictate the outcomes. We can only stand in judgment and stand in witness against what is happening and call people to do better, call even on the oppressor to live up to their own best standards, call for peace, call for reconciliation, and call for justice. Uh, this is, I think, our calling, and this is where we can, in fact, be very uh, effective. But if we're just trying to solve the problem, uh, we will always be mired in uh, technicalities and we'll be mired in uh, power politics, where we are really weak. Lauren? Um, I, I agree with what Jonathan is saying um, on this issue. I, I want to approach it a slightly different way. Um, the importance of the interconnection between issues. So when you, you know, when Ferguson was um, erupting, and, um, and, and afterwards from Ferguson to Palestine uh, was a rally cry because of the recognition of the oppression of African-Americans in the United States and the oppression of Palestinians. And I think this is um, part of the, the, the outcry of uh, the work of the church to not only call things out individually, but to show the interconnection between injustice, both here and there. Um, and that includes the militarization of the police, which we know um, there are many cities, out, including uh, Minneapolis, where George Floyd was murdered, that uh, had been trained by the military police in Israel. So there is a, a horrible opportunity uh, for us to continuously lift that up and bring it for accountability, as Sahar said. And we can't get to reconciliation until there is accountability and truth telling. And we have um, the model of South Africa and Desmond Tutu and the truth and reconciliation process. So part of our work is to help get the truth out as difficult and as dangerous as it is, so that when the day comes, and I do believe that part of our understanding as Christians that there will be a day uh, of reckoning uh, and reconciliation, that those truths, those terrible truths can come to the light and for the forgiveness to begin and the reconciliation. That is part of our work also in the future but you can't get there without the accountability. Thank you, uh, Lauren. Jonathan, I wanna follow up a, a little bit on, on your um, self, uh, you, you said it was uh, uh, perhaps controversial. The title of this webinar is A Human Rights Framework for a Political Solution. So say a little bit more about uh, uh, what such a framework, a human rights framework means. D does it imply uh, a particular political solution? What would it look like? Your book deals with some of the possibilities. Uh, does such a human rights framework 
uh, suggest a particular political solution or is it merely uh, uh, general principles? It does suggest a, a general uh, solution, but it also uh, realizes that any solution, including the best that you can imagine, should always be uh, critically reviewed and should always be under God's judgment. A large part of the problems in the Middle East is that many good people think they have the solution and are willing to violate human rights, to kill people, to torture people, to do whatever it takes to get to that good solution. Yeah. Yeah. And in the process, they become part of the problem rather than the solution. Uh, I think the human rights uh, approach sets a number of principles. And then anybody can use whatever solution they want to approach that ideal, but there will always be a little bit of humility. There will always be a recognition that the methods we use themselves can be problematic. You know, that is why violence cannot be, in my view, uh, a, a tool that is used to arrive at this solution, because in the process, you're hurting other people, you're creating tragedies, you are creating problems. So nonviolence for me is a very important component in, in trying to arrive at a solution. But, but, but it's also important to give a solution. It's also important to provide a vision, to provide a goal that people can aspire towards. That, that we're not just talking, you know, kingdom of God, uh, otherworldly. We're talking about how we can actually live <laughs> together, what that might look like in real life. Uh, I think we have an obligation to at least present a viable uh, solution, but we don't have the obligation to bring it about. We have the obligation to work towards it, towards justice, towards human rights, towards equality, uh, okay. against oppression, against injustice, and against violence, I think. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Lauren, and then Sahar. Um. I, I'm just resonating with my, my colleagues here. I think the part I would add, and perhaps, Michael, um, you might be asking this uh, as well later, but we were talking about a human rights framework, but I am um, thinking about uh, my own statement that it is not up for us to determine what sovereignty should look like. So if that's true, then... Um, and the Palestinians decide to go the way of the one democratic state, as um, people like Jeff Halper and others are um, discussing, then we have to uh, enlarge our understanding to include civil rights and not just human rights. And, and we don't have to wait for that to happen. We have many Palestinians now living inside Israel uh, after the nation state bill that was passed uh, 2019, I think, 18, um, and which has codified into law, like Jim Crow laws, uh, the second class citizenship of Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And, and so um, that too becomes something, particularly for us in the United States to pay attention to, because we have been there, we are still there, um, and we should be able to call that out as well. So I would, um, uh, in my own head, the framework for human rights, I make a slash and say civil rights. And I yeah. feel like this is a beginning conversation um, that we must begin to also give our attention to. Thank you, Lauren. I am going to come to that in just a second. Uh, so that's good. I'm, I'm glad that you said something about that. Uh, uh, Sahar, though, I want to give you a chance to respond. A <laughs> I, I find it difficult uh, for me a bit because I think being on the ground, seeing what's going on on this level, and it's, it, I'm not so optimistic and I don't want to be worried with the solutions. Because for me, 
yes, the human rights and dignity and equality and uh, stopping all the violations is the urgent and, and the priority now not whether it's one state or two states or three states or a federation or what's the i'm sorry to say maybe both sides both people are not ready fully for the final solution because lots of crimes out of this violence that the israeli state is imposing is taking place that you cannot discuss solutions why your houses are demolished, your people are killed, and, and thousands are imprisoned, and how you will discuss, what you will give up more. So for me, the priority now is stop all this. Thank you for that. No, there's there's a, a lot of wisdom in what you had to say. Uh, so I appreciate I appreciate your honesty uh, from on the ground, Sahar. I want to just uh, point out that we have about 15 or 20 minutes left, and I have a whole list of questions left. So uh, if succincter was a word, uh, I'd ask you to be even more succinct uh, uh, in in the answers in the in, in the coming few minutes that we have. <coughs> We had a question in the chat room, and um, uh, I have a question here about uh, refugees uh, and the right of return. There, there are many specific implications when you adopt a human rights-based framework, but in everything I read, every article, every paper, every conversation uh, about such an approach, the right of the return of Palestinian refugees is listed not only as an important, but a necessary part of the conversation. So talk about uh, Palestinian refugees and Jordan and Syria and the diaspora and the importance about the right of return. Uh, Sahar, would you uh, take that one, please? Yes, thank you. I think it's, it's really very important and very essential to discuss the right of return. And I should highlight the right of return is not just for the refugees living in Syria or in Lebanon. It's internally and not just in the occupied territories. Yeah. Yeah. I'm coming from a village in the Galilee in the Lebanese border called Fasuta. And it's a Christian Catholic village. And we remained in 48 out of a sudden but just near us, there's two Christian villages, Ikrith and Bir'am, who were expelled in the 48 internally. The, the, the people are still living there in Haifa and in other places in the Galilee. The high court in 1953 confirmed that they should go back to their villages. And this decision was never respected by the government of the state of Israel. And these people are, are visiting their villages as strangers. So how you can seek justice, how you can solve this, this uh, 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 I don't want to call it conflict because <laughs> really it's much more than that without discussing the right of return of, of the Palestinian people. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, the, the, the right of return is, 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 is really crucial for a number of reasons. One reason is because it puts the lie to the whole logic uh, behind the creation of the State of Israel as a uh, place of refuge for Jews who are persecuted elsewhere. Uh, and and uh, it turns the whole conflict into a demographic conflict of who has more people on the ground and who can be uh, kept out. From a moral point of view, it's, it's, it's just so obvious. And from a legal point of view, international law is very clear. The very uh, UN resolution that created the State of Israel specifically makes that conditional on allowing the... Uh, Palestinian uh, right of return uh, and those who reject the right of return don't do it on moral ground they do it on the grounds of power if we allow these people to return we will no longer be the dominant majority and therefore we should they shouldn't be allowed 
uh, to return. Uh, so morally, legally, and ethically, the right of return is essential. Whether it's exercised or not is another matter because many people may choose not to exercise uh, that right. But to deny it is at its very roots, a, a, a racist, a discriminatory, uh, a uh, statement of privilege. One party should have that right, but the other party shouldn't. Yeah. It, it also denies the possibility of a reconciled life together. Uh, that, that Jews and Arabs can live together in Palestine uh, rather than be always in a zero-sum uh, situation where you have one more dunum, I have one less dunum. You have more babies, I feel more uh, uh, under, uh, more threatened. Uh, you bring in more immigrants, uh, I, I, I uh, feel uh, somehow vulnerable. Uh, no, uh, right of return is an essential a human right uh, that, that puts the whole conflict, the whole situation on a different status than what it is on now. Right now, it's on the basis of power. Which yeah. group has power and domination and rights and whose interests should be taken into consideration at the expense of the other group? Thank you, Jonathan. Lauren, um, uh, what... <clears throat> What would a gospel-based, rights-based framework have to say about the return of refugees, the right of return of refugees? The right of return of refugees, I, I won't repeat what my colleagues have said because they said it so well. I'll come from the angle of dangerous memories. Um, having worked on a project, the fabric of our lives for the YWCA of Palestine for close to five years and in interviewing women in the refugee camps, the, the power of that project, besides um, being able to, to uh, work with women doing embroidery and bringing forward their stories, the, the importance of that was the dangerous memory of what happened in the formation of Israel. And so many people don't know this and they are meant not to know this. Because once you know, you can't unknow the violent uh, way in which the state was formed. And it challenges, in particular, um, Christians and Christian Zionists, going back to our other webinar, um, whose land is this? Uh, who are the indigenous people? Whose history counts? And, and so besides the international law, UN Resolution 194, the right to return as soon as possible, the fact that this is an ongoing issue. I had friends in Jerusalem who had been living uh, their families in West Jerusalem who could drive by and see their family home occupied by Israeli families. This is not just something that happened in the past. It is an ongoing sense of uh, forced dispossession and displacement. Um, it is what's behind uh, the issues in Sheikh Shirah today. So this issue uh, is both important for history, for challenging the right of inheritance for Abraham's children, and for the current situation, um, and particularly in Jerusalem today. Thank you. Um, I want you to be very specific here. Uh, adopting a human rights-based framework, what should be the first things that should happen internally between Palestine and Israel? And what would be the first things the United States and or the inter international community should do when such, if such, a framework would be adopted? Jonathan? Yeah, now we're talking about tactics. And, and in my view, and people may not like to hear this, in my view, when you're working on tactics, you, you start with the low flying, uh, low uh, hanging fruit. Uh, you think about the idea of no way to treat a child. Uh, and and, and you, you can find a lot of hard Zionists who will tell you, yeah, you're right. That is no way to treat a child. 
we shouldn't wake them up at three o'clock in the morning and, and harass them and traumatize them. If you want them to come, uh, if you want to try them, you just send a notice and their parents bring them to the police station the next day. The next day. Uh, ending administrative detention. Surely you can't just arrest somebody without trial and without uh, uh, evidence. Uh, surely you can't just have people take people's land uh, without a proper procedure uh, and without proper uh, intervention by other people. So, so we can start on, on, on very clear and obvious things where nobody disagrees and try and shift the, a little bit ameliorate the situation. Now I know many people don't like that. They think that you are only beautifying the occupation. You're making the situation a little bit more toler tolerable. But the truth is you are alleviating some suffering. And, and there is a possibility of, of carrying out campaigns because the other side is depending on utter power. Yeah. And anytime you challenge that absolute power, you're going to get pushback. Uh, this is, by, by the way, again, to get back to BDS, this is one of the reasons why they are so hostile to BDS, even though it may not be very specifically uh, effective on the ground, for them, any challenge is yeah. not acceptable. Any victory is not allowed. Even if it's just Ben and Jerry ice cream, they, they have to be fought and they have to be fought to the nth degree. Uh, so to even state that there are laws that are applicable even to the powerful is, is, a, is itself a powerful statement. Lauren, um, the first things that the United States or international community should do, could do when adopting such a human rights-based framework. Well, uh, or, even, or even churches, yeah. Yeah, so I'll say it again, I think the, um, the embassy needs to go. I think the cons consulate needs to come back. That's a symbolic show of um, saying that um, Jerusalem is not the capital of Israel. I think the nation state bill um, should be known and discussed, um, particularly that um, Israel is a Jewish state. I mean, just that statement alone needs, needs to be known and interrogated. And people need to know about all the other peoples who live there. Um, and so I think uh, that's part of it. Um, I also think that the boycott, divestment, sanction movement that our church supports um, in many ways and has followed through on, particularly in divestment, this is a hot issue in the United States, as it is also related to our First Amendment uh, rights, which uh, we as a denomination in particular um, have a proud history uh, in the civil rights movement of boycotts as a action uh, related to our faith. It's our, our, it's our faith in action. So these are um, things to me that come to mind um, directly. Um, <laughs> so, so those are some of the ways both uh, in the international community and also um, our government in particular uh, needs to take action on. Thank you, Lauren. Sahar? I totally agree with both of them, definitely with the, the BDS uh, uh, like actions that should be taken. Uh, but I think also you have a responsibility to pressure your uh, 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 state to recognize Palestine as a state and to push on the UN level uh, to reconfirm re the committee of uh, against apartheid because this is would be the legal tool in the international level to force third states to do embargo on Israel on the armed trade to treat Israel as they treated South Africa. This is what caused the success in the South African uh, uh, example. And we should think about a way how we should uh, 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 reactivate these tools that they were effective in South Africa. 
I'm aware that we're getting close to the time. I have just another question or two before we close. As I understand it, didn't the International Court of Justice determine that Israel has certain obligations to Palestinians in the occupied West Bank, including the right of self-determination, work, freedom of movement, protection of families and children, uh, adequate uh, standard of living, et cetera, health, education? And isn't the United States also obligated under the Fourth Geneva Convention to ensure compliance with these obligations by Israel, and if they don't comply, cease all aid to Israel until they do. So I want I want you to talk about Israel's and the United States obligations under international law to the Palestinians. Lauren, start, please. I was hoping I wouldn't be asked to go first. Um, well, I I think that you've sort of, in my mind, answered it a little bit, is that uh, the United States doesn't really prioritize, maybe even care about these things, in part because the, we have bought into that Israel has the right to self-defense, and even deeper than that, um, for those who follow the Zionist um, uh, thinking that this is their land. So there is no occupation, there are no refugees. And, and so the work um, of the church that needs to happen and others is to continuously challenge that narrative. Um, and, and so that's partly uh, where I think we need to go. And military aid, I see that Ali um, put that in the chat, is the primary money behind the power that Jonathan's speaking about. If there was any way that we could put the plug, pull the plug on this, um, and not only in the middle of the Gaza war just a, a few months ago, maybe it was longer than that, the Biden administration was passing yet more legislation to give out more military aid. Absolutely. It's inconceivable to me in some ways that we continue to do this no matter what the evidence is. And, um, and, and so I'm, we all on this um, webinar here, uh, it's more than scratching our heads. Um, we have not found a way to hold our own government accountable, even with the Leahy laws that say we're not allowed to use military aid this way. We do not seem to listen even to our own laws internally. Thank you, Lauren. Obligations uh, uh, by Israel for uh, Palestinians and the United States as well. Jonathan? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, the United States because that's the more relevant one. The Geneva Conventions, Article 1, requires all the high contracting parties who signed the Geneva Conventions to ensure compliance with these regulations. Yeah. So if they do not do enough to ensure compliance, they themselves are violating uh, these uh, regulations. At one point, the Palestinians tried to get the, uh, a convention, an international convention under the fourth Geneva Convention to say, what do we do? when somebody doesn't uh, follow the Geneva Conventions? What do we do when somebody doesn't carry out their obligations, including under Article 1? And the United States put a lot of pressure not to even hold that convention or that conference, which is why I'm saying, well, it is very important to keep uh, mentioning the obligations of the United States and of Israel under international law, at another level, we have to be willing to say, regardless of these obligations, what is happening is illegal and unjust and unfair and oppressive and wrong and in fact sinful. And we have to say this must stop. Uh, and, and, and this we can do. Uh, this is the prophetic stand that I have been uh, crying out for. You know, the church does not have tanks, does not have an air force, does not have uh, a military power. It does have political power, uh, which it needs to use more, more uh, often and more carefully and with greater uh, morality and ethics. But its, it's, largest, its largest influence, I think, 
continues to be the moral influence which it can exert. Thank you. And as many of you have already pointed out, the economic influence uh, through boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Uh, and Jonathan, I know you well enough to know that you've committed your life to such a prophetic uh, ministry, a prophetic stance. So thank you for that. Sahar, obligations. For me, I totally uh, know the hypocrisy in the international system because like the human rights uh, uh, framework could look very very positive, very good, very, uh, uh, but there's no ways how to implement it equally on the international level. Because at the end, power is the decision making. And this is how we end up always Palestinians dismissed from every opportunity to seek accountability. And this is why we should look into these joint uh, interests and programs and uh, uh, trade on the arms and security programs between the United States and Israel and use the PDS because we cannot wait till the Security Council decisions to impose sanctions to force the obligations both in the United States and against Israel. I, I don't think it will happen all the time that the balance in the international level in, is as the current situation. And this is why we, the people, have the power to use campaigns like the PDS and other ways to put the pressure and, and to, to force them to commit to do the change. I want to give each one of our panelists time for a closing word, uh, but before I do, I, I want to remind you that this was the fourth of a series designed for congregational use, exploring the implications of the 2021 United Church of Christ General Synod Resolution passed with 85% of the vote, Declaration for a Just Peace Between Palestine and Israel. The two sponsors of the series have been the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network and the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. I want to especially thank my two partners, Reverend Allie Perry and Reverend Lauren McGrail of the UCC PIN Steering Committee for all their hard work in organizing this series. So, uh, parting words. Jonathan? Uh, I have to start by thanking you, Michael. You've done an, an, an amazing job. Uh, prepared a lot of questions that were very thoughtful, very insight, insightful, and drew out of us uh, more, uh, I think, responses than we would have brought about if we had just made a presentation each. Uh, I think this has a, been a very useful uh, exercise, and it can be very educational to different congregations. Uh, I, I will end up by saying that while human rights uh, oriented approach is really a secular one, it refers to international law and human rights as secular documents and instruments. Yet at its very roots, it is a very faith-based and in fact Christian one, which people who believe in God and in the sovereignty of God and in the dignity of human beings born in God's image uh, can e easily adopt and use uh, as, a, as a guiding principle to bring together uh, people who may not believe in the, exactly the same things, but who can gather around uh, a set of principles. And it also appeals to the enemy, to the yeah. oppressor, uh, to the other, uh, th that we do have some common principles that we can all uh, appeal to and we can all apply. Uh, so I think it's a very useful approach, and I definitely uh, thank you for bringing it about and uh, bringing us together in this uh, gathering. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. thank you so much, Jonathan. Sahar. Also, thank you so much, Michael and uh, Ali and Lauren and everyone who worked on organizing this. It's very important and very supportive. Uh, and I think we should uh, not lose the hope, uh, uh, even if it looks 
difficult, complicated, and so far that this is all will end, but I'm sure that justice will reveal it, it, it's, it's the life, like it can't last forever. And this is why we should keep going in, in trying to use every platform, every opportunity that we have in order, not just to raise the awareness, but also to implement actions. And PDS, PDS, PDS is the most powerful action. Thank you. Thank you, Sahar, very, very much. And for the work of Adamir. And uh, I wanted to tell Jonathan, we stand with al Haq. We stand with uh, uh, you and Adamir, Sahar, as well as the other organizations uh, uh, that are under uh, uh, threat uh, in, in Palestine and Israel. Lauren? Your final thoughts, closing thoughts. Well, um, thank you, Michael. I always know that when we do these interviews that you've done more than your homework and that you're gonna ask things that I kind of wish you wouldn't ask, but you did. And, and we squirm around and that's okay. And, and also my colleagues, and I, I want to affirm and, and some things that I'm left thinking deeper about. Um, Sahar, when you mentioned uh, the solutions are, are something uh, over here, but right now we're dealing with this. And, yeah. and it makes me think that um, um, if I were to reimagine this title, uh, uh, human rights as a framework for, um, for action and as well as a solution, uh, as a way of thinking, even before action. Um, I, I agree with um, Jonathan, it, it's like a, the ground floor uh, for moral behavior um, and that our um, work in, in the, from the faith perspective is, is to come in with what our clear principles are and, and work that floor and, and build from the way up to challenge the authorities when we can. And, and BDS is one of them, but the prophetic speaking out at every turn is another. Um, and, and so I think that is uh, kind of what I want to kind of leave with. And this um, mix of people, and those of you who are uh, uh, listening and, and watching, it's, it's unique, it's special, and, and I think it feeds us all, at least it feeds me to continue to do the work wherever I can, whether it's in a, a sermon, a prayer, uh, an action in the street, um, bringing it forward when we talk about Black Lives Matter, um, as my church does here. Um, so thank you, um, uh, Michael, for joining the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network and bringing forward the main uh, components of our resolution so that we can take um, uh, action to make it become real. Thank you all. I want to just say in closing that I've kind of scrolled around the screen during the webinar today and saw so many friends but, uh, and, and, and partners and mentors uh, really in, in our work of justice uh, uh, for full human and civil and political rights for our Palestinian friends. And so I want to join with Ali and Lauren and Sahar and Jonathan in thanking all of you who've joined us not only today, but over these four webinars. Thank you for your partnership in this work. And uh, uh, Godspeed on your way. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.